I think from the beginning of my uh, work in consumption, I've had this feeling that because consumption is so familiar, because it's something we all do, we sort of take for granted that we know what it is, that we understand it. We can see where it's coming from and we can see what its consequences are. Um, and yet, uh, when you actually start engaging with it systematically, when you really spend a year with people shopping, or you watch a society sort of develop into becoming a consumer society and it wasn't before, um, you start to realise that it bears almost no relation to these kind of rather glib things that we, we, we say about it. So one of the things I hope this book will do is challenge people's idea that they know what consumption is, that they, they kind of reflect on their own practices, and of course they are the experts. Um, I think if they read this book they're going to start questioning that and think, well, you know, maybe there are other things going on there that they haven't had any particular reason to think about. Um, but I also hope that if my arguments are convincing, um, they will only have to go through a moment of self-reflection, think again about what happens when they actually do shop, or think again about the relationship they have to their um, cars, whatever it is, and I hope they're going to say, you know, I think this guy's right. I think this book is actually plausible on the basis of that which I, kn I know from my own experience. Um, but it matters because this is a book about consumption and its consequences. And in a way, if consumption didn't have such huge consequences, the fact that we might be suffering under sort of certain illusions about what it was wouldn't matter so much. Now you're dealing with things like climate change. Um, consumption is potentially a vehicle for the destruction of our own planet. Right now, it really does matter that we do understand what consumption is with a reasonable degree of accuracy. Because otherwise, the prescriptions and the policies that we come up with in dealing with very serious issues um, like pollution, like uh, climate change, are going to be wrong. If you just listen to people talking about consumption in, in sort of everyday life, or if indeed you look at the journalism, the newspapers about consumption, you start to get the idea that somebody just going about their sort of shopping um, is this kind of embodiment of, of hedonism, of, of the pursuit of pleasure, of materialism, a concern with things at the expense of people. Um, they're, they're very individualistic, and that's the modern age where of sort of we're superficial. Um, and we tell ourselves uh, these things about shopping, and yet uh, it doesn't actually take much reflection to think that if you do what I did, which is to spend every day going with people, who are the people I'm actually going with? They're generally housewives, uh, people who are actually engage in work, but also having to look after the house. And the housewife is probably the figure for us who is the least individualistic, least hedonistic, least materialistic person that we know. Um, so shopping must be about something very different. And what I'm trying to get at is what actually is going on there. And look at the kind of um, realities of, of the difficulties of shopping for, you know, for your kids and for your husband and for provisioning the household and making sure we don't run out of toilet rolls and um, that, we, yes, we always have that particular brand of, of soup, etc. It's not just pandering to some business. And studying business will not tell you what is going on around shopping. Unless you actually engage with those relationships, with the household, um, with the needs of the person who is doing this labour, because labour it is, I don't think we understand it. And what I'm trying to do is, is force people back to look at the thing they themselves do day by day in that world of consumption. Yes, I think it's very important that when you look at any kind of what you might call ethical shopping, whether it's, it's shopping in charities or indeed buying organics, there's two entirely different reasons why people might do this. Um, and one of them might be altruistic. You might get organic foods because you care about pollution in Iceland or somewhere. Um, you might buy in charity shops because you want to give money um, to people that are impoverished. The alternative, of course, is that you're buying organic foods because you think other foods might be polluted and that's bad for your personal health. The reason is entirely selfish. Similarly, you might go to a charity shop and buy goods simply because they're cheap. You get bargains. Um, it doesn't you know, matter where it came from, but you're actually getting something you wouldn't otherwise have got. Again, an entirely selfish reason. And that's why you need to do these studies, because you need to find out actually what's going on there. And on the whole, my studies and indeed other people's as well, 
um, tend, unfortunately, to suggest that the main motivation in a lot of this shopping is much more personal. It's much more concerned with our own interests. But what works in ethical shopping is that it has the kind of gloss that a, at least apparently you might be shopping with altruistic intent. Um, and that's important to know because there's a lot riding at the moment on, on what ethical shopping might do in relation to things like climate change. And if we suffer from the illusion that it is what we would like it to be, instead of what our evidence shows it probably actually is, again, we're going to get it wrong in terms of the potential of that shopping in dealing with, with really important problems in the modern world. I think the really important point about the kind of academic work I want to do is if you look at the way most academics operate, they're at one end or the other. They're either dealing with policy or modelling or abstractions, um, or they're kind of people who burrow into the sort of nitty gritty of everyday life and try and present that as a study. Now, in that sense, academia is really not working because the latter is not informing the former. They're too separated. So in all the work that I do, including this book, what I'm constantly concerned with is how do you bring these two things back into conversation with each other? You look at what the policy is implying about what consumption is, and you're showing they're wrong. They're making assumptions that can be challenged. Um, that isn't what consumption is. And then you're looking at the actual activity of consumption and realizing that then has consequences um, that we didn't imagine because it's different from what we thought. Um, but the really key thing, and, and what this book does in a number of different ways, is to make sure that you constantly see how each of these two ends of the spectrum are put back together again and don't just fly apart into their own separate kind of academic domains. I think one of the points about this book is I've always felt I want to be the kind of academic who doesn't just produce results that accord with my own opinions. Actually, I really dislike a lot of things that I've had to say in this book simply because my research results don't support what I would like to be the case very much around consumption and climate change, where I started this work hoping that I could say really important, useful things about changing ways of consumption as a resolution of these issues, and I don't. I argue that all sorts of different ways of dealing with climate change because the world doesn't accord with what I expect. So I hope people recognize a certain, if you like, integrity of academia, um, that we speak to what we find. But that world out there that we're exploring is a complex world. And equally, I don't want to sound like I, having done this work, am absolutely sure that this is the right stance and I know what the proper argument is and I'm kind of laying it there for you to contend with. Actually, these are really important issues like climate change and they deserve proper argument. And in dealing with them, one wants to take into account a number of different key perspectives. So unusually, what I've done, particularly in the first chapter and the last chapter, is I've actually divided myself, as it were, as author, into three different characters you'll meet. So you're going to meet Mike, um, the environmentalist. You're going to meet Chris, the sort of sociologist concerned about you know, welfare and fairness. And you're going to meet Grace, a Filipino anthropologist who speaks from the experience of her family and her upbringing um, and, what she, and, and what she learns also from being an anthropologist. And they don't agree with each other about anything. Um, and I think that's important because I think that you, the readers I, I hope A will enjoy that kind of dialogue instead of being kind of simply having a narrative. They actually get themselves engaged in these arguments. Maybe they identify with one character more than another. But also, I hope it's going to help people um, go through the arguments in their own head. I think we all need to know what our stance is on things like climate change and on consumption, and who should be enabled or where it should be curbed. Um, we talk about this all the time anyway. I hope that people reading this book will feel a great deal more informed. Um, that's what the research is intended to do. I hope that there's an honesty to the book in terms of not trying to say it's simply this or not even having the opinions you would expect me to have. Um, and I hope that people actually take this book as a kind of starting point um, for their own re-engagement in what are really important issues. It's not in that sense just another academic book.